This is Weights and Wealth, your one-stop shop for entertaining education on building a stronger body and bank account. We are not doctors or financial advisors, and must warn you, this is not medical or investing advice. It is for your entertainment. All right, welcome back to another episode of Weights and Wealth. Dad, are, you, are you ready to start? Yeah. All right, well, we have the, the long-awaited education part two episode. Yeah. If, if you want to go back and watch part one, that's episode 43. Is that Absolute right? Absolute banger of an episode. Mm-hmm. Um, if you enjoy monologuish type episodes, <laughs> that was one of them. <laughs> yeah, it's the same voice just for an hour and a half. And even we thought that one started getting too long, which is why we have a second part now. Yeah, this is, this is actually a five-part series. This, so. Yeah. No, but this is really good information, especially if um, you're part of our audience that's at the age where uh, you're about to start having kids or you have young children and you're wondering what to do as far as schooling goes. Uh, but Nick, can continue, sorry. Um, that was it. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> our shout-out for this episode yes. goes to one of our loyal listeners, Maddie from Rochester, New York. She recently got her master's in uh, education and helps pe- helps kids learn how to read. And uh, she helped contribute a little bit to this episode after she listened to the first episode. Um, and she said the pendulum is starting to shift back in education, uh, back to teaching phonetic style of reading instead of whole word style of reading. That was most of what part one was about. So definitely go check out part one if you want to learn how uh, the history of public education began and uh, how reading switched from whole word or from phonetic to whole word. Um, but we're going to continue off part two here, get into the latter half half of the 20th century. But uh, shout out to Maddie. Thank you for being a teacher. Mm-hmm. Despite what we say about the uh, public education system, uh, we do love our teachers. They have a very hard job. So uh, shout out to all the teachers out there as well. We need more schools for kids who can't read good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, like, like the Derek Zoolander yeah, school like for kids who can't read, read good. good. Oh, I should have worn that. Shirt. I, that shirt. I should have worn it for this episode. Next one. All right. Um, Oh, we got Weights Wisdom of the Week, too. Yes. So I guess I'll hit that real quick. Uh, the, for this week, the Weights Wisdom of the Week is to go on walks after your meals. Uh, this will, if you have a carb-heavy meal, this will help with the uh, insulin response to increase in blood sugar. Uh, it'll help you get more steps in, uh, burn some calories. And uh, if you have a girlfriend, boyfriend, spouse, uh, whatever friend, roommate that you live with, um, it's a good time to talk. Even that, even just by yourself, Nietzsche said, never trust a thought you have indoors. So if you have anything problem that you need to work through, always getting outside and, you know, looking up and seeing the sun or the stars or the moon will always help you think more clearly. Do you usually eat at night, Sean? Is that? I do. It's like a werewolf. <laughs> um, Recap, I guess, of part one. Nick, what episode did you say part one was again? Uh, 43, I believe. Uh, yeah, so um, I guess I already recapped part one. So, all right. Yeah. <laughs> Moving on. Dive right into it. Uh, Nick, you want to you wanna give us kind of the 1940s and drop in literacy? Yeah, sure. So we have these literacy rates from the military because I guess they, they – have to test people's literacy before they join the army. Yep. Um, So in 1933, uh, the volunteers had a literacy rate of 98%. um, And then in 41, it dropped to 96. And then the Korean War down to 81. So that was 15% in just 10 years. Um, And then in 1973, it was at 73%. So... Maybe the army's just recruiting dumber, dumber people, or maybe the school system's getting worse. I don't know. What do you think? I, I, I mean, could be both. To, to be fair, like the uh, the army was getting larger and larger and larger, mm-hmm. you know, throughout that whole time. So it is a possibility that with a larger sample size, you know, they got, I guess, I don't want to say less quality recruits, but they are just getting more of everybody. So obviously, you're going to have different numbers when you survey people, you know. That is true. However, the numbers Nick gave, Nick, you said 98% from volunteers in the 30s? In 1933, it was 98, and then 73 was 73%. Okay, but in between that, you had World War II. It was 
96 percent i think you said 44 and 41 it was at 96 so 41 world war ii mm-hmm. lots of people in yeah. the army right That's true. um and it was still up at 96 percent. and then right after that uh from the 40s going to the 50s you had a big increase in um what we talked about in part one the transition over to whole word style of reading and then you see the big drop occur so i think mm-hmm. it, more likely probably lined up with that, probably the, the school and not army getting worse recruits. Mm-hmm. I would agree with that. I think that makes statistical sense. Uh, another example we have here is uh, in 1940, literacy rates for whites were 96% according to uh, this study and 80% for uh, black Americans despite um, black Americans just coming out of Jim Crow at that time. Mm-hmm. Um, where they were really suppressed in a horrible part of American history. Um, but then by the end of the 20th century, we came to a drop to 83% in white literacy and 60% in black literacy, despite spending four times as much on education. So uh, that, that's another statistic from about, around the same time frame that shows a relatively equal drop. When literacy. was the Department of Education established? Oh, we'll get into that. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I feel like that might have some influence on this. So, uh, in 1965, one of the... Uh, Sean, would you say who's one of the greatest presidents? Lyndon B. Johnson? <laughs> I knew. I know he uh, liked to conduct interviews with reporters while on the toilet, which I think is pretty cool. That is, uh, <laughs> just a great way to mog people. Um, but, you know, despite being a toilet mogger, I don't think that... Uh, LBJ was our most admirable commander. So um, LBJ <laughs> created great society. Uh, when people talk about the welfare state, they often talk about the origins with Lyndon B. Johnson. Don't forget Roosevelt. Yeah, also Roosevelt as well with the New Deal. Uh, that was earlier, 19, 1930s. But uh, in 1965, right after uh, the Great Society, as Lyndon B. Johnson was focusing a lot on domestic policy. Uh, he created the, or he signed the Elementary and Secondary Education Act. From here on out, I will refer to it by the acronym that is commonly used, E-S-E-A, which I might flip around for some reason. I have a hard time saying it in that word, but it's <laughs> E-S-E-A, Elementary and Secondary Education Act of 1965. Um, in two years, federal spending on education went from $1.5 billion to $4 billion. So this is around the time that uh, went from office of U.S. Office of Education to Department of Education was okay. after the creation or after the ESEA. Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the primary purpose of the ESEA sounds like a really good idea um, on the front. The primary purpose was to provide more aid to underfunded schools with a large percentage of students living under the poverty line. The goal was to level funding for all students. Sounds like a really good idea, right? Um, problem is Constitution, 10th yeah. Amendment, education is a state's <laughs> right. So what are we doing with the federal government getting involved? Uh, in 1966, a professor from Johns Hopkins, uh, his name is James Coleman, he came out with the Coleman Report, which concluded from the ESEA that a child's early years at home had a significant impact on later performance in school and that an achievement gap existed between blacks and whites despite similarities in teachers' training, salaries, and curriculum, and also among socioeconomic lines, uh, despite teachers' training, salaries, and curriculum. Um, I have a personal mm-hmm. anecdote to add to this that mm-hmm. I think. Uh, I, I learned not about the Coleman Report when I was younger, but in middle school, I would go into the inner city in Rochester and as in the summers as part of a community service program to help teach kids how to read that were behind their grades reading level. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was when I first really learned how fortunate I was that my parents taught me how to read at a really young age. Because what I immediately noticed when I started teaching these kids how to read was that they were never taught how to read at home. And that's exactly what the Coleman report stated. Yeah. Basically, kids that were not taught to read at home at a young age fell behind and it was almost impossible for them to catch up. Yeah. Um, and that's why some schools do worse than other schools, basically. It had nothing to do with the quality of the teacher, nothing to do with how much money was spent on each student uh, or how much funding that school received or what textbooks they had. It was 
did they learn how to read at a young age? So. Yeah. I mean, my parents taught me how to read as well. Really, my mom, um, I, I hated it. I would run away and I remember like hiding behind the couch or like under my bed or under her bed, wherever I thought she wouldn't find me until she, I could hear her starting to get angry as she was yelling for me. And then I would finally come out and I'd learn how to read. But I mean, once I did learn how to read, I couldn't stop. I, yeah. I loved it. Um, I still read, you know, probably at least two to three books a month. Uh, at this rate um, but yeah I can't imagine like having, having like school makes everything so much more terrible. boring and terrible <laughs> and you know if you can acquire a skill at home with someone who like genuinely cares about you and isn't getting paid to be there I think you're going to be 10 times better off yeah and like kids will naturally read if you yeah. let them choose books they're interested in so like my parents would always bring us to the library and to go pick out three books every like week or maybe more than that whenever they brought us. And we would, as much, my mom would like just wait in the lobby for quite a while waiting for us to go find whatever books we wanted. And she, like, it wasn't like, go just grab three random books. It was like, find books you're interested in, crack them open and like read a couple pages, see if you're in it. So that when we went home, we had books we were interested in reading. Mm-hmm. Uh, so shout out to my mom for really <laughs> um, helping us become good readers but um even like in college you said school just makes things boring yeah. like i will say it probably stunned my growth because <laughs> i would spend way too many nights like reading and doing oh, yeah. like a dawn and i i probably could have been six too but yeah <laughs> no what do you find my, my reading abilities uh, it's done my growth um but it, in college like i was not the best oh, no. student I would say but then I would when I started becoming a personal trainer I would go to the library and take my like nutrition textbook and read it cover to cover take detailed notes and like I would study th- these textbooks for classes that I wasn't even taking because it was <laughs> stuff I was interested in yeah um, so yeah it's, it's uh, definitely the way schools force books that people don't like upon them. Like kids are just going to learn faster if they read books that they want to read. Mm-hmm. Um, 100%. So in 1981, um, I found this, I think this was either from the book that Nick read or the book that I read. We read, we both read a John Anthony Gatto book. Nick read, what, what did you read, Nick? Uh, dumbing down. Yeah. Nick, Nick read dumbing down and I read, um, Mm. What was it called? The Underground History of American Education. Uh, two books covered it a little bit in part one. Uh, so, again, go back and read part one. But John Anthony Gatto was uh, a very well-respected, award-winning teacher uh, in New York that quit te- public teaching because uh, he couldn't stand the education system anymore. But uh, one of the things that we learned in those books was uh, when Dr. Seuss wrote the Cat in the Hat, uh, this is a direct quote from Dr. Seuss. I did it for a textbook house and they sent me a word list. That was due to the Dewey Revolt in the 20s in which they threw out phonics reading and went to a word recognition as if you're reading a Chinese pictograph instead of blending sounds or different letters. I think killing phonics was one of the greatest causes of illiteracy in the country. That's exactly what we yeah. covered in part one at the beginning <laughs> of this episode, right? So, um, and then he said, there were 223 words on the list. And I went through the list multiple times and decided if I could find two words that rhymed, they would be the title of the book. He found Cat and Hat on the list, and that was the title <laughs> of the book. And that's how he made Cat and Hat, or see Cat and Hat. Um, so that's kind of a, that was a crazy story to me. Yeah. Um, but that's Dr. Seuss verifying. Because some people say, no one's taught how to read whole words. Everyone, like, I didn't learn it that way, but like, that, mm-hmm. was, that was a major shift in American public mm-hmm. education in the, in the 20th century. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I didn't go to public school. I, I didn't see the inside of the school until I was, you know, 14. So maybe, maybe some people still learned how to read uh, that way. But I, I, I think it did change back at some point. Uh, yes, that's to, what to uh, Maddie said, the shout out from the beginning. She said it, it's been swinging back the other way because I guess they realized <laughs> literacy rates um, 
Do you want to go over the survey here from 1993? Uh, sure, sure. Uh, so there's a National Adult uh, Literacy Survey from 93 representing roughly 200 million U.S. adults over 16 years of age with an average of 12 years schooling, public or private. And uh, roughly 42 million cannot read at an elementary level. Uh, 50 million can recognize fourth and fifth grade level words, but struggle to write simple letters. 60 million are limited to sixth to ninth grade reading levels and struggle with basic math. 30 million have ninth to 10th grade reading proficiency and only 3.5% have literacy rates uh, high enough for a traditional college. Uh, it was roughly 30% in 1940. So that's a <laughs> significant Same. drop. Um, if you if you want to talk about the uh, no child left behind after we just kind of if anyone has any thoughts on those uh, statistics, yeah, um, I, yeah. Do you have any thoughts on the statistics, real quick? I mean, I, I mean, like I'm sure they're correct. I just kind of find it hard to believe. <laughs> it is. It is. <laughs> it is very baffling that these are people that like you know get married, have kids, work a job, you know, live normal lives, but they don't know how to read. I don't, I don't yeah, know. so I think I think it's, when you I think when they break this down, like mm -hmm. you look at three point five percent have literacy for traditional college study. Mm -hmm. I think that's not just like oh, can you read a book of this level? Well, yeah, I think it's, it's can you like read and understand, away, yeah, yeah, yeah. reading comprehension, mm -hmm. and then also like I don't know about you guys, but the books we read in high school and college were not difficult books no. at all to read. And we wouldn't like in, in college, it was the most ridiculous education ever. But like if we were in intro to philosophy, we wouldn't actually read like any full books by philosophers. <laughs> it's always like, you know? like, oh, this chapter, taking yeah. it out of context so that the professor can yeah, like, some read, weird diatribe. read this little chapter over the course of the next week instead of oh, let's all read Meditations by Marcus Aurelius and discuss it next week. Mm -hmm. It's like, mm -hmm. all right, we're going to go super slow. We're going to break down this one chapter that gives you like a definition of this philosophical view. And it's, mm -hmm. it's like people should be able to like read these books. <laughs> that, that was one of the biggest uh, changes from when I, I spent my freshman year at Dayton and went to Notre Dame. Um, my political uh, theory class that I took at uh, Dayton was similar to that. I remember like I had to, I sat down with my professor because she gave me a B on this thing and annotated all these things that I apparently did incorrectly. And so I requested a meeting with her and for about an hour I went back through and like showed her where all her corrections were actually wrong. And here it is in the book. Like, here's the page where they said exactly this because I would quote it. I had a proper bibli bibliography. Everything was, you know, annotated correctly. And she she would literally take quotes. And I wasn't paraphrasing. There were direct quotes, you know, with a footnote. You can find it on this page. She would say, the author didn't say this, blah, 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 blah. Like, you know, minus one point or whatever. And so I said, I had to sit down with her for like an hour and go back through the book and be like, Hey, no page 12 literally says it. Yeah. Is this at Dayton? Like, you yes. Said? Oh my gosh. Uh, we had, Whereas we had some bad professors. Nick, was, and I, uh, rough. Nick and I had an English class freshman year together. Mm. And, uh, wow. That was, you want, you want to comment on it, Nick? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I didn't get as into it, um, with her <laughs> as you <laughs> Jensen would. <laughs> Uh, but we would get there and it would pretty much just be um, Ted and then one of the other guys that lived on our floor <laughs> freshman year just going at it with her. I have been known or was known in high school and college to um, bring other viewpoints to the classroom. <laughs> Let's just say that. Uh, whether it was, I mean, in, yeah, in high school, any kind of social studies class so skewed. Um, yeah. I mean, yeah, it, it was ridiculous, but I, I would always um, challenge professors if uh, I thought something was being misrepresented. And <laughs> um, our English class freshman year, I don't think we read a single book in our English class freshman year. I don't think we did. I think they were, uh, were it was they like a writing short. 
I think, yeah. It was a writing class, but even the writing was go watch a movie and write about the Mm -hmm. diversity of like it was yeah i mean this was was seven eight years ago i can't remember back that far too well but it was i mean it was uh yeah i mean i i don't know i i did read a few good books though like i like i remember reading wealth nations in our history class oh you did yeah okay um and then i read dante's inferno in another class oh okay so I mean, I spark noted. Yeah, well, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I, I didn't. I didn't get to read any uh, books in college. Although, for one of our friends freshman year, I, I did read the book for her, her history class and uh, Killer Angels mm. by mm. Uh, Shara. I forget his first name, but that was a really good book. But I was interested in history, and I wanted. I wanted to read it. Yeah, so I, yeah. I read it. And yeah, yeah. I, just, I just thought it was interesting because, like, after my transition to Notre Dame, the first political theory class I took there. Um, we read all of Thucydides' history of the Peloponnesian War. That was the assignment, and then it was a blue book test. So it was like, you know, one question, and you had to answer it in like three pages. And the first time I I took it, or it was like it was like the first half of the book, the first test. Like I thought, you know, like blue book test, you can kind of like argue you know that's the whole point is that you're reading comprehension your argument and stuff like that and generally I, I would do well on those because even if i wasn't like perfect you know on like the the date that this happened or stuff like that i always understood like what was going on and i could articulate it and stuff like that and i got i got like a c plus on it and i was like oh my gosh so i went back through and i reread the whole book like three times front to back and I got you know I got like a hundred on the next test but I had to be so exact like I had to literally answer it like like a like a like a stock answer like that's what they wanted like I pretty much had to memorize two to three pages of like certain certain sections of it and be able to rewrite that section and then analyze it. It was like above and beyond anything I had experienced. And it was, it kicked my butt. (laughs) (laughs) But I guess the point of this diatribe on our college reading in uh, different classes is that uh, the books presented aren't as challenging. So when it says traditional college study, uh, people aren't really reading at the the same level of books that they were uh, back in the 1800s. Yeah, no way. And everyone was, I think... Not everyone, but when uh, a lot of people had kind of a better education through books, mm-hmm. at least. Even even nowadays, like most people that read books, they're not reading anything of value. Like my mom always says, oh, it's like it's chewing gum for the brain. You know, it's you're not getting anything of value out of it. It's just like firing up your brain cells a little bit, reminding them that you need to use them. You know, it's kind of like you're not you're not growing in any way. You're just you might as well read fifty thousand billboards in a row. You know? <laughs> Are you not, you're not a fan of romance novels, Sean? <laughs> no, I'm not. <laughs> so moving on to uh, No Child Left Behind Act. So uh, when we look at the ESEA uh, that we mentioned earlier from uh, Lynn B. Johnson that really got federal spending rolling on education, uh, it was re-signed every five years by various presidents. Uh, so in 2002... It was amended oftentimes mm-hmm. when it was re-signed every five years, but uh, it was there were big changes made in 2002, and they called it the No Child Left Behind Act. What this did is it increased federal funding and established accountability via nationalized test scores. So if you grew up in our era, you know the ELA and standardized <laughs> testing. Oh, yeah. Uh, standardized testing became huge. It really exploded. And that was because schools had to give these tests and they had to show improvements in reading and math test scores uh, every year or they could face penalties such as losing funding from the ESEA. Um, So again, just like the ESEA in 1965, take this at face value makes sense, right? Mm -hmm. Might seem like a good proposition. Um, But once again, bad consequences from good intentions. Uh, So what wound up happening is teachers would, after this, spend a lot more time teaching to the test or, I mean, infinitely more time. It was 
a lot of classes just became, I mean, I, I remember from growing up in elementary school, it seemed like a quarter or a half of our year was preparing for the ELAs. And so you're not, at that point, you're not developing and getting to a higher reading level. You're learning how to take this test mm -hmm. so that you can answer these questions correctly. And then, yeah. you know, you're not progressing, reading more challenging, more challenging books. You're learning which ski and drop bubble to fill in. Yeah. Uh, so what do we think that's going to do over time to get to like literacy rates? And well, it just canalizes you. You know, you're not, you're not actually learning anything. You're learning how to take a test. And it's like, you, you know, like if you want to get a better back squat, like you're going to do Bulgarians, you're going to deadlift, you're going to do barbell rows. Like you're going to do a bunch of other stuff outside of just squatting. You know, it's the same, same concept. You know, it's a, if you want to get better at reading, if you want to become more intelligent, you, progress and you go, you know, harder and harder books, more difficult concepts. You read a variety of subjects so that when you're reading a book on economics, you just finished a book on political theory. Maybe you could be like, oh, well, you know, I understand why, you know, this politician is advocating for this because this would give, you know, the U.S. some type of advantage in foreign policy, you know, like. There, there's different, like the, the more, the wider the variety of genres that you are acquainted with, the more you'll be able to kind of put together the big picture. And yeah. when you're just taking a test, it's just. Yeah. I mean, and like this, this bill kind of took the power away from like the local 100%. community to like kind of figure out what they want their students to learn. And it also takes the power away from the teachers to mm -hmm. kind of be able to meet kids where they're at, I think. And then. I don't know. It, 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 it just put too much power on the federal level, I think, and they can't get really granular enough to really know what each community needs. Yeah. I think that point Nick just made about meeting kids where they're at is yeah. the key from this, right? <laughs> um, this is kind of what a lot of what Nick's, the book that Nick read, Dumbing Down, was about how um, kids, teachers were no longer able to um, help the more advanced kids continue developing, right? Because mm -hmm. they were, they had to be dumbed down to level the rest of the class so that everyone's just preparing for these tests. Mm -hmm. The teacher can no longer say, oh, hey, Jimmy over here is actually at a seventh grade reading level, even though he's in, only in fifth grade. Um, so we're gonna this, give this clump of kids, we're going to give them these books because they're more challenging. No, we have to dumb everyone down to the same level, right? And is that yeah, because like they could also be like, oh, we don't have to worry about Jimmy passing the test. Like we yeah. know he's going to pass yeah. it, so we're just going to focus on these other kids. That's the tyranny yeah. of equality. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that's. I mean, it's dangerous. It's, those those concepts all go together, right? With like the federal government pushing down more control. Well, they, mm. they push everyone down, right? It's kind of like <laughs> yeah. we, we were talking about earlier, how uh, not a rising tide lifts all boats, but lowering tide <laughs> lowers all boats. Um, but that's also what happens in socialism, like with yeah. everyone's uh, everyone's pay. So um, just this, this theme that the Weights and Wealth podcast loves to hit on, where when the government, the federal government gets involved. Just leave us alone. It, <laughs> just leave us alone. <laughs> um, I talked to a uh, when I was writing the testosterone ebooks this is, this is a while ago this was last year um, but we started developing the outline for this a long time ago um, we, I mean episode 43 part one occurred quite a while ago so we've been developing this this outline for this episode for quite a while but when I was writing the testosterone ebook I was at a coffee shop because that's usually where I like to work mm -hmm. helps me be very productive but there was a uh, high school English teacher that I was sitting next to um and I started asking her about literacy because we, Nick and I have been reading these books and preparing for these outlines and I want to get her thoughts on it. Uh, and I'll tell you what she said on the No Child Left Behind uh, policies. She said, uh, they are the biggest pain in the... Booty? Yeah, booty. Yeah, there we go. We like to keep this show clean. So, so they're the biggest pain in the uh, booty and that those policies created a generation of children that simply can't read effectively. Um, so there you go. There's a, 
Person on the street interview <laughs> conducted by Weights and Wealth uh, that uh, shows that these these policies, while they may look good at face value, have just continued to have more and more detrimental effects. I just keep thinking about Derek Zoolander throughout this entire episode. <laughs> <laughs> Is this a school for ants? <laughs> might, might rename this the, the Derek Zoolander <laughs> yeah. podcast. Uh, but yeah, I mean, to go off that, like, you know, the, the absolute focus that No Child Left Behind had on the ELA the Common Core, which kind of came into vogue when we were in high school. Um, I'm a year behind you guys, so like it was like really implemented. I, I remember being a freshman in English class and like them talking about Common Core. Like this is a new thing, you know, the Obama administration came out with and stuff like that. It essentially just like pushed even farther, like ELA, 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 <laughs> and math. That was it. And that's all they cared about. Um, I mean, to be honest, I, I freshman year of high school was my first year in a school, so I didn't, I couldn't tell you if it was any different than, you know, middle school or grade school and stuff. Um, but I did uh, find this article from Forbes talking about how there's, it's just simply further evidence that Common Core did real harm to U.S. education. Um, it basically indicates that having these standardized tests that focus only on these two subjects caused uh, school resources, as you said earlier, to just be solely focused on that. And that results in science, art, foreign language, and all that stuff to suffer. And all of those uh, resources going to students that at risk of performing poorly or failing the test. Um, all those resources went towards them, gifted students and, you know, ones that didn't really need a helping hand were kind of left up to dry um, because of these ELA tests and mathematics tests that all these schools were ranked on. Um, since they were only judged on these two uh, subjects, you know, having a wide range of learning and a wholly rounded out educational you know, process seems to have kind of been just thrown out, you know, yeah, we don't, we don't care about, you know, creating a new Michelangelo or a new Da Vinci, like, you know, a guy who can do everything and is, is ta talented in multiple ways. Um, they just want, you know, uh, a specialist, you know, and I think there's, I forget who said it, but there's this one quote that says specialization is for insects, you know, like, like human beings are not meant to do solely one thing. Mm -hmm. Like you have to be able to do everything. Like you should, you should know something about everything. Someone, even, even if you're not a subject matter expert, you know, you should at least know who that person is or like, you know, something about that subject so you can contribute to a conversation because otherwise you're just going to be a, you know, dead weight in that type of conversation. If someone brings up a subject, like I'm not the biggest sports guy, but I know, I know enough about football to carry a conversation, you know, it's, but it's not something I spend most of my time learning about. Yeah. So it's, uh, I mean, it's just the classic, like, um, a jack of all trades and a master of none. Mm -hmm. But then the second part of that quote that most people don't know is, but still always better than a master of one. Yeah. Right. So, mm -hmm. um, the funny thing about common core, uh, that was introduced in 2013, I believe, um, yeah, I think I, I did more of the No Child Left Behind. Sean yeah. Nick did more of the Common Core, but um, it the reason that they got rid of No Child Left Behind is because they, ha they had to start giving out waivers to states for test scores not improving year over year because that was the metric. ELA and math have to improve year over year. If you fail two years in a row to raise scores, then you're going to start losing funding. Um, but then human beings aren't the S&P 500. Though, you know? <laughs> like, I feel like they, they really should have factored that in be like, hey, hit these benchmarks, you know, like 85 percent like yeah. scoring within this percentile, not like improve every year. <laughs> well, <laughs> you can't be reading that 102 percent, you know. <laughs> but then they started giving out waivers to states that weren't showing improvements. Uh -huh. And then it was like after like six or seven years, they had 25 states that had waivers. <laughs> so like, OK, we need to get rid of this. We need to do common core. And then what did go? Sean's a common core was, right. was more yeah. ELA, yeah. more yeah. It's just like it's the same thing. Keep but throwing just... money at this burning flame. It's, it's, yeah. Then that's what the government does with everything. But yeah, um, yeah. 
Yeah. I mean, I think, I think we can all agree that like after our toxic charity book, you know, like the amount of money that you throw at a problem is not going to fix it. Yes. You know, yeah. and oftentimes it only makes it worse. Yeah. So. Uh, toxic charity is uh, a book that will really good episode, uh, episode 69, I believe. Nice. So a little bit in the future from right now, yeah. we record these episodes like 12 at a time. So we it's just recorded that one. <laughs> But yeah, t- little little time warp in the podcast, but good episode. Um, Toxic Charity by Robert Lupton. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, it's a very good point. Should we t- address the uh, more the, the next era of changes to public school? I think we should actually do like a full episode on that solely okay. um, because I think having just an off the cuff discussion about it will not do it justice because I think it is worth delving into. Um, I know that there there are plenty of, there's plenty of research potential and, you know, psychological analysis that needs to go into this. All right. uh, From us armchair. We'll be expanding this to a six part series. Um, Mm -hmm. We'll be, we'll be inserting a part where we uh, talk about, Alfred Kinsey and, yes, and John Money and John Money. Yeah, look Money, up. Money. Look up. Look up John Money. It's an incredible hack Crazy. to create uh, passive income. <laughs> <laughs> same with Ruby. Same, same, same with Ruby Ridge. Look, look, look up Ruby like, Ridge. Easy Ruby way to find <laughs> precious stones in uh, your local <laughs> national park. Yes, and uh, Alfred Kinsey and fraudulent research with uh, <laughs> pedophiles. But we'll get into that, um, the changes in the last three years or so to public education. Um, but basically what this, this whole series is gearing towards on education is um, that uh, to the young parents out there or our uh, listeners that are about to become parents, those in our demographic of like 20 to 24, mm-hmm. uh, which is a core part of our audience, um, you have the right to make choices about your children's education. and. Uh, you don't have to settle for the norm that uh, a lot of us grew up with. But even you know, even for older people listening, you can get involved with your school board. Mm-hmm. While your kids are out of your house, you know, you can be a part of your community still. Run Absolutely. for school board, have some control over this stuff. Uh, go be you know a gym teacher or an English teacher if you're if you're bored and doing something looking for something to do in retirement you know that's a great way to get involved in your community so uh it's not not solely for young parents and yeah way too often for everyone yes (laughs) we are are an equal opportunity (laughs) podcast um (laughs) yeah that's that's the one thing (laughs) Um, but yeah yeah so uh you know get get involved and uh You know, listen to part one and uh, be sure to tune in for parts three, four, five, and six of our education series. We'll uh, we'll end this episode with uh, another quote from John Anthony Gatto from the Underground History of American Education. He said, I don't mean to be inflammatory, but it's as if government schooling made people dumber, not brighter, made families weaker, not stronger. Ruined formal religion with its hard sell exclusion of God, set the class structure in stone by dividing children into classes and setting them against one another, and has been midwife to an alarming concentration of wealth and power in the hands of a fraction of the national community. Um, and, uh, Amen. Yeah. It's... All right. Thanks for tuning in, and we will see you guys next week. Bye. Thanks for joining us today at Weights and Wealth. And don't forget to apply today's lessons to live healthy and wealthy. If this conversation will contribute to your fitness and financial gains, please share it with a friend or family member and give a five-star review so more people can lift bigger weights and get bigger bank accounts.